Hi everyone, today I want to talk about um, a, a little example of how impredicative types would have come in handy uh, earlier this week and, and sort of actually a fairly practical programming uh, exercise that I'm going in. Um, uh, I'm probably going to make a, a, a couple of videos sort of all related to this. I'm building a, a, a fun little library and I'm getting to use all the sharp tools that I get to develop inside of GHC. Um, so before we get to impredicativity though, I, I want to talk a little bit about dynamic types. Um, because this, you'll, you'll see, it'll all connect. Um, so, so GHC has this uh, capability called, um, uh, well, it's, it's, the capability is called type reflection, but it's the, the key class is typeable. So I'm going to import type.reflection. Um, and let's see, what can we do with this? So with type.reflection, we get a type called type rep. Um, so I'm going to make a function called produce. And this produce function is going to, well, produce something of type T. Um, now, you might think, well, if, if, it, if it could have any type T, then the only possible definition I could write here is something like, you know, error. But I don't want this, th th that's, th this is true, rather, this, this only being able to produce error is true if we don't have any class constraints. Um, if we do have a class constraint, it can produce something else. So for example, if I say num t, oh, now we have more possibilities. This might be 42, and this all type checks. Instead of num, though, I want to use the typable constraint. Um, and so the typable constraint essentially makes t a runtime type. I can do checks at runtime to see what type this is. So um, what I can do now is I can say, um, if I produce, I can check to see what that type is. So I can ask, what is the type rep of type T? And then I can compare that using the eek type rep function to some known type. So let's say I want to see, is T an int? So I can write that like this. Now the type eek type rep function, if I point at this, will I get its type? Oh, no. Uh, if I do this, will I get its type? Oh, usually I get a little thing right here that says evaluate, um, but not today, evidently. Oh. Um, okay, how can I get its type? Um, um, if I do this, there we go. So type rep takes a typeable constraint and it turns it into a type rep, which is a type representation. Um, and then I can do eek type rep which takes two type representations of different types. So this is a type rep of type A, this is a type rep of type B, and then checks if they're the same, then it returns a proof that they're the same. Um, so there's a little bit of fanciness going on here. Uh, let's not worry too much about the fanciness and just try to apply this, and then we can see where this is all gonna go. Um, so if I can, I can check against just hruffle, the justice to match this maybe, and the constructor of the colon twiddle twiddle colon type is H ruffle. H here stands for heterogeneous, um, and that's because A and V might have different kinds, although that doesn't really concern us in this example. And so if indeed T is int, then I can say return 42 here. Um, and let's see, does that compile? Um, not in scope, type variable t. That's because I need to bring it into scope using for all t, which, which triggers the um, uh, scope type variables behavior and allows t to work down here. So right now I'm, I'm operating in GHC 9.2, so this is all GHC 2021, which has a lot of extensions enabled. Um, but let's see, we still have an error. Oh, this requires the GADTs or type families language extension because hruffle is nice and fancy. So let's turn on GADIT. Um, okay, and now everything works here. So this is this is pretty good, and I can actually run this function. So if I load, um, oh, maybe I don't have load impred.hs. Is that going to work? Okay, pattern matches are non exhaustive. That is indeed true. But if I ask for produce at type int, I'll get 42. If I ask for produce at type bool, well, non exhaustive patterns. And that's right, because we've checked to see is t int? Yes, it is. That's 42. Otherwise, well, we don't really say what to do otherwise. And this works for all kinds of types. So instead of doing just this, I can say type rep at t. If it is bool, then I want to be false. And I can even do something fancy. Oh, I wanted to do, um, ooh, let's just do this because it's fun. So I can say 
app um, uh, tycon arg is type rep t, and let's say the tycon is maybe. Um, oh, but I need to pattern match against just href again. So that means this is maybe of something. And so I can return nothing here, hopefully. And then we'll just say otherwise equals, oh, well, I don't have a good thing to say otherwise here. So maybe produce will actually return a maybe t. And then we can do just, just, this is a little confusing, but we could do just nothing. And then here we can just return nothing. Um, okay, does this work? Uh, it does, then that's defined, but not use that's fine. Um, uh, I could also make this recursive and then return just of just of something if I wanted to. That was, this would all work out nicely. So this is a little bit about this, this dynamic type. I'm doing some runtime type checks um, and then being able to return a variety of different types from this function. So once again, we can experiment. If I ask for produce, maybe int, we're going to get 42. Produce, maybe bool, we'll get just false. And this all just works very nicely. Um, okay, so that's the bit about dynamic typing. Let me now get to the bit that actually involves in predicative types. So the data.scientific module, so, so if, if you've ever done parsing of JSON, when you get a number in some JSON, the ASON library parses that into a scientific. So let's see about this scientific. So if I do data.scientific, does that do something? Yes, and so we can expand this here, I think. Um, ah. And then we get data scientific. It's an arbitrary precision number represented using scientific notation. But this is the target of parsing numbers that come in from JSON. So once I have this scientific, I want to be able to convert this into something else. And the standard, or maybe not the standard, but one way to do this is that there's a, um, a function floating or integer, uh, which is this. So I can click on this and then we can read its documentation over here. So this takes a scientific, so again, this is some representation of a number that maybe the user has written in some JSON code. Um, and this, we wanna convert this depending on whether it's a floating kind of number or an integer kind of number, right? So if it's 3.14, we need to store that in a, in, we wanna store that maybe in a double. If it's just three, we'll store that in an integer. And that's what this floating or integer does, is it looks to see whether the number is actually a, a decimal number or if it's a whole integer. And depending on which one it is, it returns either one or the other. So this sounds pretty good, but it has a really bad uh, um, interaction with dynamic types, um, the way that I'm doing this with typable. Because let's say I want to write a function. Let's get rid of the spotlight for a sec here. Let's say I want a function um, convert scientific. And I'm going to take a scientific and convert it into some type t where we have typable t. Um, oh, why am I getting error? And, oh, maybe because I haven't actually written the thing yet. Let's worry about that in just a moment. Or, or maybe, maybe, maybe we could do it right now. So here, um, so typable t, scientific to t. Well, what I want to do is I want to check to see whether the scientific is floating or integral before trying to do all of these type checks, right? Because if it's integral, then I want to see if t is maybe int or integer and have those work. If it's floating, then I want to see if t is float or double. Um, so that's kind of awkward here um, because so if I do this, I can write floating or integer, or I should have case here, shouldn't I? Case floating or integer, psi of left floating right integer. And then here, maybe I want to do something like, um, so this is the floating case, and I might say just href is type rep of t equals the type rep of float. And then if it is, um, I can just return floating here. Um, and, and floating will be of type float, right? Because this convert scientific is going to return a T, but I've just learned that T really is float. And so I should just be able to take this floating and return it as a float. And then here for integer, we'll get just href.fl is type rep T eek type rep of int. And then we should just be able to return the integer. Um, okay, so let's see what happens if we actually try this. So the first thing we're gonna end up with is not in scope. Well, that should be easy, but I'm expecting some small trouble here. 
Um, and so we import data that's scientific and we don't know scientific. Well, we can see here that that uh, there is a there is a problem here. Um, I I spent some time spinning my wheels on this um, and couldn't quite figure out a way to get it all to work with HLS. So we're going to turn off HLS here. Stop the LSP server, and instead we're just going to go back to GHCI and and use that. And just to show you how how this can work, if you say cabal repl, and then you can do dash dash build depends to sort of get a package in and make it available. And so this should bring us to a GHCI that has scientific available so that we can we can slurp this in. I, I do kind of miss the old days where you could just install libraries and, and not fuss about this, but uh, this should work for us okay. Um, so let's see here. So now I want to load impred.hs. Okay, so now we're starting to get these other kinds of errors. That's fine. It says, oh, do I want rank n types? Illegal for all. No, I want scope type variables, but I thought that was going to be on by default. I don't know why it isn't. Um, that's fine. We can try that again, though. Okay, and type applications. Oh, maybe because I'm launching in Cabal, but it doesn't know that my default language should be GHC 2021 or something like that. So I have to put in all of these extra extensions that I don't really care about and should be on by default, but are not. Um, oh, but I bet I can fix that. If I just say set x GHC 2021, aha, I bet that works. And then I can delete these bits that I shouldn't need. Load. Okay. Not in scope type variable t. Okay, that makes sense because I need to say for all t to trigger the scope type variables um, uh, behavior. Okay. Now we get the actual error that I wanted to see. Couldn't match type i0 with int. Hmm actual type expected t actual i0 i0 is untouchable well let's see that has to do with the fact that here i am doing a pattern match and once i learn an equality then ghc sort of stops doing type inference because it's really kind of impossible to do reliable type inference in the presence of um of these equality assumptions but why so let's see, do we, do we know even what I0 is meant to be? So it's this expression. Ah, so it's saying here that when, that, that this integer has some type, we don't know what it's going to be, um, but, but we, we won't be able to sort of make that type be int because we sort of learn about int too late, essentially. So what I could do, I suppose, is I could take this floating or integer, and then let's say this is float and int. I don't really want to do it this way, but let's see what happens if I do. Okay, so then this works. Um, but what if I do this? So it, they, um, whoop, doo -doo -doo -doo. and then now this runtime type maybe it's the type integer and not int. And now I'm back in trouble here could not match int with integer. Because up here, when I call floating or integer, I had to decide, oh, if it's a floating, I want it to be float. If it's an int, if it's an integral, I want it to be int. But, but the whole point here is that I don't want to have to decide that in advance. I want to just decide that after getting my left or my right answer. And, and the current structure of floating or integer, let's remind ourselves of the type here, because that is important. Uh, oh, uh, not in scope. Import data.scientific. Okay, so I'm going to put this in my source file in a comment because it's so important for what we're trying to understand here. Um, oh, wait, I can just use one of these. Um, so, so here, what this is saying is that we choose R and I before ever doing any computation. Um, and that is exactly what we don't want. We want the choice of R and I to be sort of after the either. So instead, I want to write my own version of floating or integer, I'll just call it f or i, which takes a scientific just as before. But here, instead of choosing r and i in advance, we're just going to choose that in our individual, you know, left and right uh, uh, bits of data here. So I could say either um, real float r or integral i, this is not going to work, um, because I really want these to be locally quantified. So I have to make that, there we go, this is what I want. Um, and this right here is an impredicative type. An impredicative type is a type where we take some type variable 
in this case, the type variables that describe the either type and instantiate them with a polytype. And so here, this, this left component is going to be this for all r, real float r implies r. This right component is for all i, integral i implies i. Now with this new f or i, we can get the behavior that we want. So for now, I'm just going to say that this is undefined. We're not going to figure this out quite yet. Um, but up here, now instead of using floating or integer, I can say f or i, and I can't pass those two things in anymore because they won't make any sense. And now I hope when I reload, oh, well, we need to turn on impredicative types. Sure we do. Impredicative types. Ha ha, all is well. And that's because here I've made my left or my right choice before figuring out what the type of floating should be or what the type of integer should be. So that after I make the left or right choice, I can learn more about these types and then have it all work out. And here I can also have something like this, eek type rep. Uh, this could be double, for example. And that still works. Right? Because here, once we learn the type, then we figure out, okay, in this case, both uh, float and double are real float. And so we can take this polymorphic type and specialize it to float, or specialize it to double, or take this and specialize it to int, or specialize it to integer. Um, unfortunately, the, the scientific uh, uh, library doesn't even expose an adequate API to define this FRI in my own program um, uh, really quite the right way. Um, so let's see, what's the closest I can get? I think I can say, if is floating psi, then um, let's see here. Uh, if I do this, I want scientific to R. Uh, okay, so to real float, that looks very promising. So I can say here, uh, left to real float psi, otherwise right, and then actually, if I look at um, what other options we have here, well, there's unsafe coercy things. There's no sort of two integer. There's only two bounded integer and things like that. So the, my, my best thing to do here is, um, is what, actually? I don't even know what a good thing to do at this point is. Let's just take a quick look and see if there's anything here that might yield something interesting. Um, so we can do to real float, to bounded real float, we could do to bounded integer, but there's no just to integer. Um, and so I don't really want to do any of these things. And I think I'd have to do floating or integer again, which is really kind of silly. Um, so otherwise, I guess I can do case floating or integer um, psi of left. This really should be impossible. So this is very gross. I'm using error, that's bad, right? And, and then here, if I pass in int, I think I'm going to get a type error. Yeah, because um, uh, let's see. Couldn't match expected type. Oh, well, uh -huh. it's also, I have to say, write int, don't I? Um, uh, and then here, couldn't match i0 with this polytype. Oh, couldn't instantiate unification variable. Yes, 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 write int. That's not a great error message, is it? But I think really what it's saying is that this int isn't polymorphic enough. I need to do something here that would work for any integral. So let me remind myself, remind myself, um, what do we get out of integral? I hope we get something useful. Oh, well, it's, it's num, so I should just be able to use from integer. Let me just use from integer. And so if I say from integer here, I think that will work because from integer is polymorphic in just the right way. Aha, yes. Um, and so here we, we have some non-exhaustive patterns because I'm only looking at some things. Let's not worry about that so much right now. Um, instead, the, the, the key observation here is that by using this impredicative type, I can actually do the behavior that I want. And, and bringing it back to sort of, I started saying, this is gonna be something that's actually useful. This is really something that I ran into as I was trying to decode some JSON in a, in a library that I'm writing meant to be very applicable. It's, it's actually, it's all about um, uh, sort of a system to track dependencies among pieces of data with rules to compute some data from other data. And then we need to have the JSON to have all of the data. It's a very sort of practically oriented library. Um, that's not quite done, not quite ready to release it yet. Um, but this was a real problem solved by impredicativity. 
I hope this has been interesting. Thanks very much for watching. Bye.